Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is October 29, year 2023, 4 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. This is Professor Hamamoto coming to you from an undisclosed location. And um, coincidentally or not, um, uh, there's a local person here, or he was local, I think he might still be in prison in the Sacramento area. He was implicated, uh, well, he was at the, at the center of a, a huge scandal that involved federal law enforcement, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> I'm not used to um, speaking so much. even though I'm so, um, I'm just a few minutes into the cast. But um, his name is uh, Rick Singer. He's a Sacramentan, but he also lists his, um, his address in Newport Beach, California, which for those of you who may not be aware of it, I'll move closer to the microphone so I don't have to exert my voice so much. Uh, I'm without my external camera and my microphone at my usual setup here. And uh, I'm in a um, situation where I can't speak too loudly <laughs> anyway. But anyway, Rick Singer uh, uh, was a near neighbor of mine in the Sacramento area. And he was uh, involved, he was the centerpiece of what the FBI termed <coughs> Operation of Our City Blues. They know they were in the midst of a really institutional en enhancing case, sort of like the Unabomber. That was one of their, they misspelled it. It, sh it should have been U-N-I bomber, uni bomber, but someone uh, was not a good speller, but they spelled it U-N-A. That was with uh, uh, the case of mind control involving Harvard University. And uh, Professor Charles Murray having this longitudinal experiment with Ted Bundy, right, known as the Unabomber, who is in prison. He has a life term. Uh, so they named this, named this one, the FBI people named this one, Operation Varsity Blues. And uh, like most of us, and um, I'm not speaking for everybody, but uh, I, I was intrigued by the the scandal as it broke, especially since it involved a number of celebrities that for better or worse um, were center stage in American popular culture at a certain point. And the main one being Lori Laughlin, who you might affectionately remember as uh, Aunt Becky in Full House. And the other main actor was uh, Felicity Huffman, I believe it was. Uh, I'm not so familiar with her with her career, although I know she's a uh, fairly well-known actress or actor, if you prefer. And uh, Aunt Becky, Lori Laughlin, started out as a uh, teenage model. I think um, she was discovered, quote unquote, this is part of the origin story of uh, Lori Laughlin. Um, she was discovered when she went to go to an audition <clears throat> with a friend of hers to the Eileen Ford agency and they signed her on the spot almost. And from there, she did a lot of magazine advertisements and it's clear that she was being prepared for bigger and better things. I won't use the term groomed because that has a certain uh, connotation today in 2023. But she progressed through the ranks of um, younger talent and her big break uh, came with uh, the weekly situation comedy known as Full House, as I have already mentioned. But she did, she did appear in a couple of uh, I guess you'd call them B-movies, around the time that uh, Keanu Reeves <laughs> was uh, beginning to hit uh, hit the uh, movie scene, right? 
Who would have known Keanu? And then and they built him up to um, superstar proportions. So we'll take a look um, at a moment in a moment to to show you a little bit of the rise of uh, Lori Laughlin. But she's just one of at least fifty people. They made it seem like it's a huge operation, Operation Varsity uh, Blues, but they only brought in fifty people. I'm talking about the FBI. Uh, who were indicted and convicted, and presumably justice was meted out to them, and whether it be in the form of a jail sentence or a restitution, uh, not restitution, but a fine, a hefty fine, or both. <clears throat> and in the case of Lori Laughlin, in looking at her career, she lost a lot of lucrative contracts. But uh, we in America are quite forgiving, right? Uh, there are second acts, there are third acts in America. This is the, the land where you can be financially bankrupt and come back. You can be morally bankrupt you know, as long as you're a lovable, roguish person. Um, we will overlook a multitude of sins. Um, I'm even saying that uh, a few years from now, Sam, Samuel Bankman Freed will become a, lov a lovable teddy bear of a icon amongst his um, cohort. Um, a lot of older people might be a little bit disapproving of his uh, morality, but uh, beyond what we're seeing today, SBF represents, I, I believe, a new, uh, a, a new sea change, a sea change in the public morality. Um, it hasn't quite worked its way through law enforcement and the courts yet. But it is, <clears throat> and that is the sign, and that is in keeping or in, with the entrepreneurialism that's been promoted by the very schools that are selling admission, including Stanford University, by the way. Stanford keeps cropping up in terms of uh, intellectual fraud with um, their former president <laughs> who had to resign because of uh, academic dishonesty. Dishonesty, Professor Levine Tessier, he's Canadian uh, American, probably um, it comes out of the corporate world as well. And that's part of the problem. There was, over the past 20 years, there's been a fusion between corporations, military, and, uh, and higher education. They're all one. It's called corporatism. And it's for that main reason that I think it's going to be very difficult for we Americans, uh, if we ever had it. Um, Hyper to uh, regain some semblance of the America that we grew up with in the immediate post-war period. Um, the election of Donald Trump was an aberration. Now, the other side thought they had already won and they had it in the bag. I'm not talking about the election. I'm talking about the hearts and the minds and the, and the institutional capture that we're seeing now uh, being exposed on the, at the highest level, including with the president of the United States. And it's only appropriate because there's cheating going on at, at all these different levels, including um, maybe there's even cheating in whether you would get into the right prep schools. That, that has not been really looked into, but we do know about the Operation Varsity Blues and the scandal that busted out about three years, three and a half years ago, by 2020, 21, the main people who were indicted, uh, including Aunt Becky, Lori Laughlin, were given some uh, prison time. Probably one of those low security ones that SBF is going into because he has a lot of flax already working for him. One of them's Michael Moneyball Lewis, who's written a whole series of books about scams, right? So he should know from the inside out. But SBS uh, parents and his network, they had a, a foresight to get Lewis involved in the inner circle of SBF so he could rewrite the story. So he's not gonna do hard, not according to me, right? I know there are others that are saying, yeah, he's going to join, he's gonna have a hard time, but he might even skate because of some sort of plea that'll involve uh, attention deficit disorder or ADHD or Adderall. He was diminished capacity. There was a whole slew. I don't, 
this is years ago, a couple of decades ago, where there's a whole slew of people who walked because they, they came up, uh, they meaning the attorneys and the, the law uh, enforcement complex came up with this notion of uh, diminished capacity and were able to win uh, a series of landmark cases uh, to, that allowed a lot of people to um, either evade responsibility entirely or be sentenced to um, shorter prison terms than we might have expected or, or, or wanted or spared the death penalty, right? So it goes on and on. And justice is historically based, um, right, from from decade to decade. It, uh, it changes in accord to <clears throat> the latest uh, psychiatric fad that's in, uh, overcome or concocted. And by the way, I wanted to mention that uh, F. Lee Bailey, if anybody remembers, um, um, and um, Marvin Bell, uh, Melvin Belli, they came to the fore because they were able to really, especially Melvin Belli, in fact, he even sponsored seminars featuring hypnotherapists like William Bryan Jr., who was involved in assessing the mental health of any number of people. I'm kind of digressing, but um, I've been steeped very heavily in following the SBF and the FTX case right now. So it's swimming in my head. And as most of you know, <clears throat> he took took the stand at his own defense, which most commentators uh, said that was not a good idea. Uh, but I think it's a good idea. It's a great idea. It's, it's, we're going to feel sorry for a teddy bear uh, SBF. And he's got really well, well, highly place that we haven't even heard of. We're just talking about his um, connected to parents, right? Uh, Barbara Freed and the father is, what's his name? Joe Freed, I can't remember. Who not, they're, they're both professors at Stanford, you know, in the law, law department, the law school, right? Um, so anyway, it's, the SPF case is pertinent to what's going on here with college admissions. Now, the case of SBF and Caroline um, Ellison and some of the other people, is it David Wong and uh, Nidal, uh, some of the other second string players in, in the FTX story and the Alameda research team. You know, they are brilliant uh, young people who were able to get into these elite institutions uh, by dint of their own intellectual abilities whether tutored or native, but mostly they grew up in milieu. Uh, parents, for example, who were professionals, to me, that's the biggest indicator of whether someone gets into one of these elite uh, institutions. Um, but for those of us, this includes me, by the way, I only, I only graduated from a state university to my other shame and humiliation. I graduated with a bachelor's degree in 1975 <laughs> in political science because I thought I was going to go to law school. At least my dad thought I was going to go to law school because he was pretty, he was hip. You know, he was hip. He, he knew what made America run. And he says, if you really want to get paid and you want to run with the gangsters, then you got to get your law degree. But I didn't uh, listen to him, obviously. Um, I decided to take the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience <laughs> by going into uh, education. I didn't do bad. I mean, you know, uh, you got to do what you have a passion for. And I had no passion for handling other people's problems or trying to get them off drug uh, charges or murder or whatever it is. You know, I know everybody is supposed to have uh, his or her day in court. I understand the principles, um, but that just wasn't for me. <clears throat> and in fact, if I may bore you for just a few minutes, for those of you who are not interested in uh, my life story, then go ahead and watch uh, Dr. Todd Grande or something or watch TikTok, right? Uh, because you, those of you who are subscribers here, and if you're not, please subscribe, will know that I 
interject myself into the stories. And when I was just doing some other tasks, looking at through some old pa papers, uh, I found some old file folders of master's degree work that I did at Bowling Green State University, which is in Ohio, by the way, not Kentucky. It's BGSU, Bowling Green State University, which was the only school at the time that offered a major in popular culture and a graduate degree in master. And I got the graduate degree after I went to aforesaid Cal State Long Beach with the BA. By the way, I'm kind of smiling about um, uh, Cal State Long Beach because you know what, it doesn't really, I'm sorry to disappoint you if you're a young person if you, and you have your heart set on going to one of the Ivy League schools, but it, it doesn't really matter. It gets you into a certain network. Uh, it's really your, your graduate or professional school that where you need to put the focus on that is law school or a at minimum master's or a doctoral level work. Um, I know any number of uh, younger people who've been through very fine, solid, relatively inexpensive uh, liberal arts colleges or they've gone through community college. You know, they did well. They were fair to middling, but it was really the, the graduate work that reflected well on this. And that, I guess, would be my case because back in 1976, I was writing all kinds of uh, articles that today are seen to run to the mill topics. And back then, you weren't writing about them uh, in an academic setting. So the larger point is, to be more precise, is that if you do what you like and you find something that no one else is doing, that's your ticket right there. When other people are zigging, then you got to zag. And the best illustration of that are all these Asian American kids who have all the check marks ticked off. They did the piano lessons and they're uh, the, the team captain of the varsity uh, badminton team and have a you know 4.5 GPA, took all the advanced. All I have, they have letters of recommendation from, from everybody, right? Still getting d denied. And that's part of the, the theme, not the primary one, but one of the secondary themes of today's talk. They still get denied by the Ivy League schools because of, I, as I said before, uh, there is um, a target audience that, that uh, the elite institutions are trying to um, put a clamp on and that's Asian American people. And uh, to finish my story about Cal State Long Beach, many years later, uh, this is about, I don't know, 10 years now, I ran into the principal author of the triple package, Amy Dragon Mama, right? You remember she was in the headlines for the Battle Hymn of the Dragon Mama. She was a She's supposed to be Asian American, a parent archetype who drives her kids really hard and to academic excellence. And I'm sure both of her daughters got in because they're connected, right? She's a professor at, law, at Yale Law School. Her husband's a professor at Yale Law School. Do you think they're going to go to Cal State Long Beach? Do you think she's going to go to Cal? No, but I encountered her at the top. She was back at Harvard uh, Law School. There was an Asian American Law School banquet. By the way, I was the I was the guest of honor. I was the featured speaker, and I was brought in there on the basis of a controversial project that I brought forward in order to redress the problem of having very little, minimal, if not, if any, Asian American, especially male representation on television and film. That's my deal, right? Remember, I went to Bowling Green to get a master's degree in popular culture. Well, I did a um, little takeoff on uh, the sellout book by Amy Tan. Some of you might remember her, The Joy Luck Club, which was made into a really lame movie uh, later on, a feature film. I think it was, was that, who did that? Was that Wayne Wong? Can't remember. It doesn't matter, but it was really stupid, just like the book itself. So it was called the Joy Luck Club, and uh, my my approach to correcting misrepresentation, like Mr. Miyagi or whoever else, you know, be, you know I grew up in the fifties, not 
you know, just within years of World War II. So that was still going on. It only became hip being Asian uh, over the last 10 years or so, right? You've got Asia files. Uh, you got these supposed connoisseurs and experts in Japanese popular culture, which I wrote a paper about in 76. Um, they're in Japan, they're in Tokyo right now. They got shut down. They were there to celebrate Halloween. But the government said, Gai Kokujin, Nai. No go Gai Kokujin. Because they're trying to bring in um, um, Holly, um, Halloween, the satanic high holiday for our Luciferians and Satanists that are that show their hand um, around this time. And so they were coming in, but the government shut them down. Do you understand? And again, it's just like we thought that the costume um, celebrations and songs about, you know, I put a spell on you and Enchantment and the witches and all the Disney films. We thought that was harmless entertainment, but it was really part of a, um, Harry Pothead. Remember him, J JK Rowling? It's a part of a grooming process um, that uh, the people in Asia are very well aware of because you know, from China to Japan, East Asia, the ones that um, uh, are inundated by, first they were missionaries, right? Denominational, religious-based missionaries, but then the popular culture came in to colonize their mind. Uh, and they read my work, they, they see me and... Uh, they understand the more insidious um, use of um, the popular culture when it's put in its uh, weaponized form. And by the way, you're looking at the person who put, uh, for better or worse, put that term into currency weaponization. I was on the Alex Jones show years ago talking about using the term weaponized multiculturalism. And that's all the gains of the civil rights movements of the 19 late 1950s through the 60s, how they would be turned around and used against average Americans as well as the, um, well, the middle class. The privileged people are the ones who, who figured out, hey, we can become social justice warriors too. And uh, we can become woke incorporated. And again, I see, I'm a cultural forensics maven that's a Yiddish word, by the way. Look at Leo Rostin's. Um, it's not exactly a dictionary. It's very fun to read through. It's called The Joys of Yiddish. And you'll understand the Yiddishization as uh, Irving Howe, who was a left liberal intellectual in the journals of opinion, uh, predominantly Jewish, second generation. I'm mentioning this because if Asian Americans want any sort of standing within the society, then they too have to build upon their own uh, intellectual traditions instead of being a bunch of techno coolies striving for that and playing a game that's rigged against them in the first place. So on the one hand, I feel a little bit of sympathy for the fact that they work so hard and only to be excluded. That's a very common theme in our history. Uh, but the second time I, don't really feel a lot of sympathy for people who were raised and groomed to paint by the numbers, because all that means is stagnation and eventual death. It's a necrotic uh, type of very highly conservative um, mindset, right? That we have to, to break. So in order to do that, I said, instead of complaining, uh, I made my own, movie and I wrote a theoretical essay published in an academic journal. I did it their way, just like Wynton Marsalis. You know, he got a Grammy in, in the same year for classical music and for jazz because the rap there was a jazz musician could not play classical and a classical musician could not play jazz, but he played both. So I had it published in an academic journal and it was called the Joy Fuck Club. And it was a theoretical uh, approach on creating an Asian American centered uh, erotica, right? Some people call it pornography, it doesn't have to be. Erotica, and erotica is, you know, whatever your moral qualms are right, about it, your ethical qualms, uh, it's a huge, huge industry. 
And uh, if you look at all the great fortunes in America, most of them, uh, the founding signed, usually men, but most of the founding fathers of these dynasties started out as crooks. They were kind of on the gray area. And I knew that because I, my gosh, I wrote a paper on popular literature, you know, for my master's work. And I looked at the Western. Western novels were really big at one point, not so much anymore. The, the, the detective novel, which is bigger than ever, starting back in the 20s and 30s, the, the pulp magazines, Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, you know, all these people, you know, and um, science fiction, right? These were all outlaw genre, literary, sub-literary, and you didn't study them at the university. That's why I wanted to do that. So I said, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the uh, Asian American erotica. And sure enough, within a few years, uh, the people who, you know, they, they watch Alex Jones. They watch these shows that I started with, and they read the newspapers. This made international news that some University of California Davis professor uh, engaged in this strategic intervention at his own expense, by the way, they don't really cost a lot of money to produce, you know. Um, and of course, publishing the article and, and theorizing it was didn't cost me anything except, you know, a few months of thought and getting the paper together. Still, an essay that I'm very much um, happy with, right? Um, and uh, I'm seeing the younger generations of people at places like UC Berkeley who read it in, in class. Maybe it's inspired uh, a future CEO, who knows? Uh, but that's, you know, that's not for me to decide. So I did that and I, I got a lot of play out of it. And it had the material um, effect of featuring more uh, yellow people in fully three-dimensional roles instead of these little stick figures that um, we've seen. So, and I'm starting out with this excursus um, because part of the reason why people like Rick Singer, who was an academic coach, and he was an athletic coach before, I think that's how he got some of his early uh, hookups, his early connections within sports teams. Because he wanted, he was one of them. He, I think, he was a coach at a local community college in the Sacramento area, and saw how some of his own. They call it JUCO, it's for, short for junior college. Because you know, I used to read Smith and Street and Smiths. So I used to read about all the JUCO players coming up to the college rank and out the basketball fanatic. I wanted to read about all the rosters of the basketball players. Then I would get the street and the NFL or the NBA versions of it. Uh, I don't follow it anymore. It's uh, it's just you know got out of control. And uh, uh, but anyway, the point is is that I'm not coming from a position of saying I'm sports. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm a sports nut. I've been that way since I was a kid. Going to see the LA Dodgers at the Coliseum. <laughs> this is before they kicked out the Mexicans in Chavez Ravine and built a stadium on where they used to live. Okay, Dodger Stadium, all right? Um, so I don't have um, any problem with, with organized sports, even at the collegiate level, I think it's wonderful uh, because uh, at the university, the college, the university, the emphasis on is, is, is educating the whole person, the whole individual. And that is not just the intellectual part of it, but the, the body and the spirit, the spiritual part of it. The spiritual part is being, is, is being murdered. We're seeing a slow motion murdered through all the uh, atheistic, um, let's forget the loaded term atheism, but the, the godless anti-God uh, approach to the humanities that were put in place there to pave way for transhumanism. If the human soul is destroyed, then we be can become just the hollow men, the shells that's necessary for the next stage of uh, human evolution, according to the, the theoreticians that go back. Gosh, I was looking at this the other day, the 
the concept, the idea of the artificial womb was workshop was theorized by a guy named J.S. J.B.S. Haldane of uh, Cambridge University, I believe, back in 1929, and now it's it's here, right? And again, I mention this not just as a amusing anecdote, it's because the university is the site of cutting edge knowledge, technology, perhaps even incidentally wisdom. And I'm proud and glad to have made it into its elite ranks, but I didn't do it to the Amy, Ch Amy Chua method. I went to, let me finish the story. When I, so she was a guest speaker as an alum, a graduate of Harvard Law School. And her dad's a genius in electrical engineering. He even has a circuit named after him. It's called the Chua circuit. Look it up. And they have a nice house up in the Berkeley Hills. And according to Amy Chua herself, she told me this. Um, <laughs> at, at the event, I was a featured speaker talking about Asian American erotica. And here was the future tiger mama and the author of the triple package who is a professor with her husband, but you know, both at Yale Law School, she, you know, she's receiving an award. So she had, we had to talk, right? But uh, when we were introduced, um, she did make a point of asking me what school I went to. <laughs> and I said, I went to Cal State Long Beach, baby. I didn't go to no Harvard. I come from the school of hard knocks. I mean, I didn't really say that. I was polite and everything. But I was going through my through my mind. So there are any number of avenues to make it to wherever you want to go. But most um, 15, 16, 17 year olds uh, don't know that. So they and their parents don't know it, especially if they they haven't been through college or university, which is a lot of a lot of people. I think there's only one out of only 25 percent of the of the population have been to college or have college degrees. I think it's lower than you think. And I'm also telling you, you don't really need one, <laughs> depending on what you, what your aspirations are. I mean, how many musicians are there who, um, you know, they started conservatory and uh, music conservatory, um, like Miles Davis, you know, who, who by the way, his father was, um, the richest man in uh, in his state. He was a dentist, not the richest black man, the richest man. So Miles uh, Dewey Davis had, all and his father had enough money to send him to New York, ostensibly to study classical trumpet. But you know, but it, you know the rest of the story. You know where he went looking for Charlie Parker, and he helped revolutionize music. All right. That's one uh, glaring example of that. And uh, I like dropouts uh, personally, or people with a dropout mentality. All right, I have a preference because this tells me that um, they're bucking the trends. They're not painting by the numbers. Uh, they're hungry. They're certainly not stupid. They have more initiative. I have a lot of respect for that. But for those people such as myself who wanted to um, go along the academic track because he thought he wanted to be a lawyer, he, he wanted to fulfill the wish of his father who was a criminal. He'd never been in jail on the short, but he had a larcenous imagination who told him to go to law school then. Uh, I'm going to be heretical here. Most of you were seeing news reports making this guy out to be a monster, Rick Singer. Yeah, he made tons of money. Um, and by the way, he later was arrested and uh, thrown into probably low security prison for a while. I think he's out now. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't want to go with what everybody's reading about Aunt Becky or John Stamos and Rebecca Romy or whatever. I want to go behind the headlines, like there's more to this story here. And, I, and that the more I, in putting together this talk, there's more to this story that I don't even want to talk about, right? For, for one, the in the interest of time, I don't, 
I promised myself I'd try to keep this talk shorter than what I've been doing lately. Um, and plus, I think dealing with uh, mafia issues is a whole topic uh, in itself, right? Uh, but I started looking at uh, the relationship between the garment industry, or as we affectionately call it, the rag trade, and the evolution of organized crime in America, and how that exists to the present. The rag trade has a lot of industries connected, especially trucking. Plus the rag trade, because of its um, ephemerality and disposability, is a good way to launder money. And we are living in a drug-based economy, both pharmaceutical, um, which the presidential candidate, Virek Wamaswamy talks about, he's the founder of a uh, pharmaceutical company called Royvant, R-O-I-V-A-N-T. And I found out in his own book, I think he's trying to launder his reputation as he runs for president, trying to spin what he was involved with in his earlier life. Well, I don't trust the guy, right? Talk about privilege and advantage. He didn't need uh, Rick Singer. He was born to his caste, C-A-S-T-E. He was a Brahmin. He talks about it. So not only does he have a sense of entitlement, he is entitled. He talks a little bit about his parents and they both are highly educated. They had to take a step down when they moved to America, but that's the story of a lot of trans Asian transnationals, right? Indians, Sri Lankans, uh, Sikhs, right? the Sikh religion, people, South Asians, in other words, um, and um, Taiwanese, American, as well, and that's one of the reasons why the income level is so high because they are elite transnationals. Now, should they be given uh, privilege to get into the Ivy League schools? I don't think so, but should they be penalized? It's a question that really needs to be worked out, especially since you have a whole caste of people in America. Supposedly, we're not in a caste system. That's a lie. It's a mis um, it's a misrepresentation of what America's about. It, there is a color cast. A guy named Oliver Cox, C O X, Oliver Cox, wrote a book, Monthly Review Press, which is a leftist uh, publisher. This is an old classic. I think it's 1940. I can't remember. You know, late 40s, 50s. <clears throat> it's one of the early books I had to read in the doctoral program. It, at uh, the University of California, Irvine, uh, which again was not the cool place to get a uh, doctoral degree, but they did have a program in comparative culture, which today we know as uh, race and ethnic studies. So again, I was ahead of the curve, but there were no buyers. Only later did the other departments really start pouring in on the turf that I helped pioneer first popular culture, sexuality studies and uh, then you know race and ethnicity i was always looking to, to ahead where the society the culture was going not what was going on now of course you have to look at the past you have to look at the present but i wanted to to um, create not just replicate okay miles davis did not seek out charlie parker so he could play how high the moon for the rest of his career no he had different phases where he said, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take, adopt electronic music. I'm going to adopt elements of the rock revolution. You know, he was very much into Jimi Hendrix. And imagine what a collaboration that would have been. And I like those admixtures here. So anyway, to get back on track here, it's because of the elite transnationals like uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, and uh, people, Taiwanese Americans primarily now, elites from uh, mainland China can get into the top schools, right? Or quote unquote top schools. Because you know, from my preface here, my prologue, that I have a jaundiced <laughs> feeling, not just because I went to Cal State Long Beach and have anything to prove, but I'm telling you, most of you out there who have an ordinary 
public education, you're, you'll do you do fine in any of those classrooms. It's just what you grew up with, just what you're used to. It's just it's a milieu than anything. Your dad was or mother was a lawyer, so you know you're used to being in a sort of a research mode, unless he's he or she is someone who operates, you know, an autopilot. Or, you know, if your father is an or mother or engineers, then that's what you're exposed to. It's not a big deal, you know. And if your mother or father is a teacher, your books are around you, you, you grow up in that. If if um if not, if that's not the case, then naturally, I'll say naturally, you have a more of a more of a struggle, you know, by, by reading and um, your your cultural references. So maybe it's good that there are the elite universities now, because it's backfiring in Asian America. They're suing these, you know, elite institutions. So the elite institutions, okay, great, we're just gonna stop testing anybody. No more SAT, no more ACT. We'll just let anybody, we'll just go um, on the basis of your strong application and not standardized testing. Because all these professions that I'm talking I've alluded to engineering, science, mathematics, the graduate or undergraduate level, or even law school, um, are areas where standardized testing can be uh, applied and gamed, as it turns out by here. Okay, just to cut to the chase a little bit. <laughs> more efficiently. He was paying, Rick Singer was paying people to uh, regrade SAT examinations. He had some of these ex, uh, SAT or SA, ACT, one of the standardized exams that you needed until recently, by the way, um, in order to get into college. He, he had them paid off, right? And I think, he, he, I'm not sure if it was him, but I've heard and read about cases of uh, having test takers go in there. But the real trick seems to lie in paying off the coaches for cooperating in a scheme to say, hey, this person here, I want to recruit in the water polo team. Because no one's looking at water polo. They're looking at the big time sports like football and basketball, right? Um, at least I, I don't. And they say, great. That's a recruited athlete. We'll put her in the top of the pile. He says, how much is that, Mr. Singer? Oh, that's going to be $200,000. So, okay, he takes 75%. He gives 25% to the coach. The head coach. I'll give you some of their names here, right? This is not going to be a Hall of Shame exercise, but, uh, um, yeah, Rudy Meredith former head woman's soccer coach at Yale University, he went all the way to the top. He was charged with information with conspiracy to commit wire fraud and honest services, wire fraud, as well as honest shirt, and a lot of wire fraud. I guess that's the, the sort of catch-all. That's what SPF, they're going to slap him on the wrist with a wire fraud um, sentence. Here's a guy, John Vandermore, 41, of Stanford University, the former sailing, sailing coach. They have varsity sailing. Wow, I want to go there. <laughs> oh, man. The former sailing coach at Stanford University was charged in an information um, racketeering conspiracy. I'll just put, make it simple. And he was he, he pled out. He was guilty at a court of, Boston, where most of these cases originated, uh, even though it included people cross country, right? California and celebs. They wanted to make sure they had some celebrities in here because maybe the FBI budget needs a little bit of help, right? When it goes up for reappropriations, right? So, so there's any number of characters. You can look it up yourself. It's really interesting to see what their background are. A lot of them are first generation, the, the guys who are paying off for their kids. They seem to be, without really looking into their background, they seem to be like first generation, nouveau riche, immigrant entrepreneurs who either were brilliant in business or 
someone found them to launder money through them and they became rich and had uh, developed contacts at golf, uh, golf club or golf club or social uh, clubs, uh, but felt that they lacked a, a proper credential a degree. And I'm telling you again, and I, I know it's not going to change any minds, but having a, a, a college degree, even a PhD is really not all that it's cracked up to be. And I'm not just saying that because I've gone through it. I'm saying it because I, I know these people who have these degrees and some of them bought them. All right. I knew this one guy who ran this outfit at my previous institution. So it's technocultural studies and just talked in a few minutes. And I, I realized that his doctorate was, um, I'm not talking about mail order. He went to a research one institution, but uh, he did it because he needed to get this, the credential in order to have this job at uh, UC Davis. And he's just one of many that I encountered. And it's not a good feeling, especially when they come into your department, like I was at UC Irvine, and they spend one year there, and, and then all of a sudden they have a degree. And here you are writing papers and you're going to seminars. And my doctoral program required three years of required courses, not two. Usually it's two required courses, two years of required courses. And then you write your doctoral dissertation, which is going to revolutionize your your discipline, <laughs> your field. Uh, but in my case, it was three. So I, I've seen these guys come through. And so I understand what she, uh, being on the receiving end or having to, to sit back and wonder, wow, how did this guy or gal get in? You know, how did they finish so quickly? Well, some money or favors were um, exchanged. That's a fact of life. It's not unique to America. I'm not saying this to uh, excuse it or rationalize it or say, yeah, we should be as cynical as, as some of these other characters. I'm not saying that. All right. I'm just trying to address reality here. What I am saying, I've already given you some workarounds, and that is to go your own way, right? Start your own little enterprise within the state institution and find allies within it that will support you. Even at the most um, hidebound departments that I had in, some of the real time ass professors who thought that they had the secret to uh, radical economics, you know. Even they had to kind of begrudgingly give you your creative contribution, even though they thought they had the answers and would like to have a disciple rather an acolyte rather than someone who's going to innovate. Right. But that's the advantage you have working in a this type of institution. You can go off on your own. If you're a medical student, it's not going to happen. Your engineering is not going to happen. But if um or a technical field, maybe it is. You know, you can be, we've had, where there are legions of stories of people in IT who had ideas that people weren't buying, right? Investors. One example is um, Zoom, which I saw the, um, a documentary on the guy. His name is, um, his American name is Eric. Yuan is his family name. He's Chinese. I didn't know Zoom was Chinese, but he's an American citizen. All right. He came here in order in order to be an entrepreneur because he as a kid he was reading about Silicon Valley. And now he's being faced with all this sinophobia of the chatcoms here, the chatcom that they have our buying up our strategic infrastructure. Right? That's that's the, the argument. But he's a US citizen. Um, that doesn't excuse them of the possibility of being disloyal. There are U.S. citizens who um, sold America out of, you know, Hansen, Robert Hansen. He, I think he was an FBI guy. The 1980s were full of American citizens who sold out um, America, right? So don't pick on the yellow man. And the reason I mention that is because that's one of the reasons why I, the people who control the Ivy League schools want to make sure that there are not very many, as many yellow people, overrepresentation of them, because they're scared. 
they're frightened, <laughs> right? They understand finance. They understand physics. They understand all the, the alchemy of wealth that the white shoe boys think they've mastered on an autopilot and they're going to just hire these intellectual coolies to maintain the business, right? Eric Yuan, Yuan, by the way, is like Yan Yuan. It's a currency. It's a great name for an, uh, an entrepreneur. He worked for Cisco. You know, Cisco, what happened to Cisco? Everybody knows who Zoom is, but not Cisco. They went under because they wouldn't listen. He's a Chinaman. He said, Chinaman, we're paying you six figures. Just sit there and keep coding away. And as I've been saying over the last couple of weeks, the yellow people are off the plantation now. Do you understand? Nothing's going to hold them back, even though the Ivy Leagues are saying, no, we're holding you back. And we're bringing in the black and the bringing the Latino who are underprepared academically, but that doesn't matter because they're going to be the bulwark against all these scary, smart Asian people, right? From India, right? Like Vivek Ramaswamy, right? And they, they know that um, there's no denying this, this force historically, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, you can put all the restrictions on there. You can say you're not going to be a citizen on and on. The United States has tried many of them. But um, initiative, brilliance, accomplishment, attainment cannot be stifled, right? Athletically, intellectually, and most importantly, spiritually, it cannot be stifled, right? You can pump people or try to pump people full of uh, gender dysphoric uh, hormones. You can encourage a whole line of thought that, hey, you need to uh, alter your body uh, to conform with a gender neutral future society. Uh, but these forces are irrepress they're the force of God, they're irrepressible. Um, so get with it, you university um, censors. And your little minions, your um, your uh, B B L F, and all these other people, right? So I'm going to go against uh, all the nasty propaganda that's been spewed against Rick Singer. And no, I don't think it was <clears throat> good that he bribed all these people. <clears throat> but get this book if you have a um. A child who's about ready to go, you know, applying for the university college <coughs> who are already in junior high, it starts at junior high school, maybe earlier, the, the, the application process. And excuse me, I need to quench my thirst. And he'll get, he, he's giving you in what he calls chapters, about 50, 49 chapters, step by step on what parents and in particular need to, to do in order to give their child um, a similar advantage that multi-generational college graduates bring into it, right? It's no big deal for them, especially if they're so-called legacies, which we'll talk about in a moment, because there is affirmative action for the rich and the wealthy. It's called legacy program. And as if your parent went to Yale or Harvard, you're going to have extra points there because you're called a legacy. That's affirmative action. And by the way, the affirmative action debate, I've been following it for 20, 30 years now. It's nothing new. It's resurfacing now as the economy changes, uh, like crypto, the crypto revolution, but also the macroeconomy imploding so these scarce resources are being fought over and education is one of them uh yeah i read a book uh as part of yeah i was out of grad school by this affirmative discrimination by nathan glazer i think it came out in 1987 he was at harvard at the time there's a whole generation of um americans of jewish background who were excluded and then they broke through and they got into the elite schools and they got professorships. They got chancellorships and deanships. They were able to move into these high level 
positions at the university. Asians and Asian American people so far have been denied that, that uh, opportunity. Um, and I won't call it an opportunity because I don't need an equal opportunity handout or affirmative action from anybody else. I'll take it myself. <laughs> right? I'll take it. And this is what the establishment is worried about. And this is what Rick Singer was trying to address. Here's, here's the, the elation that um, some students feel uh, as they're going in for their um, application here. Let's take a look. Not too long. Can you just prep me a little bit? I just want to get this over with, okay? I promise I'm not being dramatic. Like, you don't realize like, how actually terrifying this is until you have to like, click the button. Each spring, hundreds of thousands of students eagerly open their admissions decisions to the Ivy Leagues on what's known as Ivy Day. I'm not going to get in, and I'm okay with that. Don't, don't say that. <gasps> Waitlisted. Waitlisted for Columbia. Waitlisted at Columbia. That's Waitlisted pretty good. Columbia. For some <laughs> students, it's the best day of their life. Oh, I got it! What? <laughs> Oh my. But for many, it's a oh day God. of overwhelming disappointment. Redacted from Harvard. Ivy Day for me was definitely very stressful and disappointing. One of my classmates got Harvard and another got Princeton. I got rejections from all of them, so I was like, you know, where is mine? Where is mine? Sunday, come on in. Oh, what time? Shh. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> That's the elation. What time? Oh my gosh. I've been going for almost 60 minutes rambling. I'm going to have to um, wrap it up here. Uh, we're, and, and, you know, you're probably sick and tired of hearing about the Aunt Becky story anyway. But the point I want to make here is that um, the Massimo Giuliani case and the Aunt Becky case are not one-offs or, or Felicity Hoffman for that, for that matter. They're systemic, all right? And that's why the title of this particular talk is called Pay to Play. So really the questions that are being raised here by all these different magazines like People and Us and The View, they're talking about the whole scandal and all that. They're asking the wrong questions. Really the question is, despite the facts of life that, that people with money can pay for access, not just to college, but for jobs and for, for political agendas, right? The money is going to speak louder than, than your hand rigging or Alex Jones or the, you know, the supposed conservative libertarian radio commentators and all the wannabes. They're, it's not gonna get us anywhere, right? Start with the facts of life and then figure out strategies. And I've already given some examples from my own quote unquote career and go with the, the reality and then find out ways of gamemanship, right? It's called, this book's called Get, Getting In. I recommend it when I thought I was gonna hate it because I thought it was gonna be full of cynical approaches and advices, it's not. If this book, you'll have to take my word for it unless you want to read it yourself, is full of, um, of aspirations and uh, seeking ideals that are based on the students' wishes, not just the parents. Um, and the subtitle is called Gaining Admission to a College of Your Choice. So that's my contribution here. Again, when people are zigging and I'm zagging, Rick Singer, for a brief moment in time, became one of the most hated people in the country, but I say your hate is misplaced. That's the way it works. That's how Stanford University works. That's how the two kids uh, of of the uh, Massimo Giulianulli and uh, Lori Laughlin, that's how they got into USC, stands for the University of Spoiled Children. That's how they get in. This is This accounts for almost everybody who occupies a position of, of prominence, whether it's in academia, politics, corporation. So let's work with our, our limitations, our handicaps, whatever it might be, and stop crying about it and stop listening to these libertarian uh, podcasts and vidcast and uh, little loud demogra uh, demagogues like Louder with Crowder, all these retooled 
comedians and, and do your work. All right. You're going to have to put put in the work in order to to achieve these uh, objectives. It's not some kind of magical test that's going to get you over in life. Anyway, I'll leave it at that right now. I'm looking forward to watching the SBF um, cross-examination. Like I said, he was put on the stand and he testified on his behalf. And now it's the defense's turn. This is going to go on for the next week. And after that, I uh, will give you a a uh, fuller workup on who one of his main flacks are. Like Michael Lewis, I think she's a flack as well. Uh, I've already covered her in previous casts here, but I've been um, skeptical of them from the very beginning on what she represents. And I'll have some more information out once uh, SPF's um, testimony or cross-examination is completed. So support me on Patreon and subscribe to this channel. And we'll see you soon, God willing. Thank you. Peace.